So what would you say to people who say that the Old Testament isn't really there to be considered as part of a Christian faith? That's a really interesting question because I would say to such a person that you only have to read the first verse of the New Testament to know that that is not entirely accurate that we need to understand the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament is predicated on the basis of an understanding of the Old Testament. So if you like, for example, flick over to, um, to Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, the first verse of the New Testament teaches us some very interesting things because it says that, um, that this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So straight away we're told that Jesus, he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now if you don't read your Old Testament, you will have no understanding of what that means. If you read your Old Testament, suddenly you realize that this Jesus Christ, he is the center of God's purpose for salvation because he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. So why does that make any difference? Well, because he gave a very specific promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7 to David of the restoration of the kingdom in the seed of David, in the descendant of David, who was to come and eventually re-establish David's throne forever on the earth. And also that he's the son of Abraham. So you've got to go right back now to Genesis, where you understand that Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees and promised particular things. For example, the land and promised another a specific seed who would ultimately overcome and um, possess the gate of his enemies. And in that seed, would, salvation would come. And so we have, right at the start of the New Testament, two signposts going, go back to the Old Testament, like read Genesis. You've got to understand Genesis, and you've got to understand Samuel. In fact, you've got to understand the broad sweep of the Old Testament to really fully appreciate the new. Um, and so I would say, yeah, you, you've got to, have a good grasp of the Old Testament before you come on to the New Testament because the whole of the New Testament uh, can only really be understood in the light of what God has already promised in the Old. So some people think that almost like Jesus has completely wiped the slate clean and it all starts again in Jesus but the truth is that's that's not the case. In fact the Apostle Paul in the Acts he talks about the hope of Israel right. Mm -hmm. So What's the hope of Israel? Well, that's the promises that we've been talking about to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and in King David. So this New Testament is probably not the best real word. In fact, the, the New Covenant, or the New Testament, where it comes from, is actually in a prophecy in Jeremiah, which talks about the salvation of Israel and the forgiveness of sins that ultimately will, will come about to the people of Israel through the work of this New Covenant. Mm -hmm. And so actually, the New Covenant in Jesus can only really be completely understood through the understanding of the hope of Israel and the new covenant that God will offer to Israel in that day. And so um, there's that. There's just one other passage that's probably worth kind of adding to the discussion, which is in Galatians chapter 3, um, which really kind of seals that off as a, as, a kind of, um, as a kind of a subject, I guess. Galatians chapter 3. Really fascinating because now we're in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul is inspired to write scripture and he, he says this, the scripture, in, this is Galatians 3 verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that means make the, uh, the non-Jews um, be made right, through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So what we're being told here again is that back in Genesis, there's a promise that non-Jews, the Gentiles, all the nations of the earth will, could ultimately be blessed and be made right in the seed of Abraham. Now, who's the seed of Abraham? Well, we already read in Matthew 1 verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. But it really makes it clear in Galatians 3 because it's through faith in the Lord Jesus and all that he accomplished and baptism into his name that one can become part of that future hope. And so we read in chapter, in chapter 3 verse 26 that ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It says there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, etc. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus and if ye be Christ's then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? 
promise of the Old Testament, promise of uh, a coming kingdom that will last for eternity through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to understand the Old Testament before we can really understand the gospel, which is the basis of salvation. In fact, it says, doesn't it, in, um, uh, well, in Romans chapter 1, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So what we find in the Bible and, you know, through my upbringing in the Christophians is that I was taught that gospel at a young age. So I've been very privileged to, to have that. Um, and we understand that it's through a faith in the gospel that we can be saved. So you'll find that Christadelphians, we're very um, particular about our understanding of the gospel. We see it very distinctly in two halves, the things concerning Jesus Christ and the things concerning the kingdom of God, which is talked about in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter eight, and I think later on in the, uh, chapter 28. So we've got this, these two kind of sides to our faith, things about Jesus, which is about forgiveness of sin. It's about our understanding of our mortal nature and the problem that we all have that we need to be saved from. Um, uh, and then we have the kingdom of God, which is God's future plan with the earth, to fill the earth with his glory and to, um, to save his people of Israel. And so we've got these, these two halves to that gospel message. And um, I think it's quite interesting because mainstream Christianity, you know, they've sort of, um, I would suggest, move, have moved away from those two things. And so it's, um, it's very important to get back to what the Bible says. So all of our faith is very much centered on the authority of the Bible, which holy men of God spake as they were moved by God's Holy Spirit power to, to write for us. So that's where we kind of are. We, we kind of look at things through the lens of the scriptures. That's our authority. We don't have a pope. We don't have a bishop. We don't have clergy. We just have the Bible. And our understanding of the Bible and the gospel is central to our faith, um, which, as I say, is for me, is, is definitely there on the basis of my understanding of prophecy being kind of the strengthening uh, root cause of my faith, if that makes sense. Um, and therefore the effect is that I happen to go around doing a bit of speaking and try to share that with as many people as I possibly can because we believe that soon Jesus will return and there's going to be two sides really. Are we on the Lord's side or, or not? And so we, we want people to be on Christ's side in that, in that great crisis that's soon to hit the earth. So yeah, there we are, and the stone power comes and, uh, and changes everything.